gentleman you see before you is Mr. Bob Daly, the 1949 National Stunt Champion. Bob is also the creator of one of the most unique and innovative forms of wing construction in the history of the stunt event. This technique is known as I-beam construction, and it has been used in the design of many highly successful competition stunters over the years. The fact that this construction has endured with little additional refinement for almost 50 years is testament to Bob's genius. The stunt community certainly owes a debt of gratitude to Bob for his achievements, and in appreciation, this video is dedicated to the father of the I-beam wing. I-beam construction was embraced early on by the members of the Strathmore Club of Detroit, and most of the members incorporated it in their original design stunters. One of the first to employ the I-beam concept was Jim Ebiger, who used it to full advantage in his unforgettable Neptune design. Here's Fred Karn's recent rendition of Jim's Neptune under construction. It's easy to see where the name I-beam came from if you study the main spar shape. It forms a capital I if viewed from the end. Strip ribs are positioned on the top and bottom of the wing at each rib station and are supported by the spar. It may look complicated, but it goes together quite easily. The second generation of stunt flyers to use I-beam construction included these two young champions. Steve Woolley used it in his gorgeous Argus design, as did Bill Werwidge in the legendary Ares. Bill felt so strongly about the advantages of the technique that he designed and built most of his models around the I-beam wing. He probably knows more about this type of construction than anyone else, by virtue of the number of models he's built over the years. He started building I-beam wing stunners in 1955, and he's still designing around the concept to this day. In this video, Bill will guide us through the construction of an I-beam wing as he produces a replica of his three-time national champion, Ares. Before we hear from Bill, let's take a few moments to look at just a few of the many famous I-beam stunners that he has produced. Back in 1953, uh, and I suppose you'd have to consider this 53-54 period, 
Uh, I first saw these I beam airplanes and uh, I saw as many of, as six or seven at a time. I was very impressed with them. They were uh, all beautifully finished. Uh, they were airplanes that uh, were totally outstanding on the field. There was little known about the way they were built. The uh, Strathmore Club pretty much kept them a secret. And uh, I was very interested in them. I was flying Barnstormers at the time, and that was uh, pretty much the, uh, the main airplane of our, our area. And uh, because the information was so hard to come by on these airplanes, uh, it took me a little time uh, to, to come up with uh, any semblance of order of the way they were built. Uh, I built the, the first ones strictly from seeing uh, the, the construction, strictly from seeing the, uh, the combat planes, their combat planes, which were in essence the same, mostly with straight spars, not a true I-beam. Uh, all this seemed very complicated at, uh, you know, the age of 11. And, uh, but when you desire something bad enough, you go ahead and, uh, and you keep finding ways to, uh, to achieve this goal. As I got further along, uh, I received help from uh, Art Pulowski, uh, Milton Booz, Roland McDonald. And uh, while I never received plans, airfoils, numbers per se. Uh, what I did get was a, a true feeling of the way the airplanes were built and finished. And back in, those, in that period I would build uh, four or five airplanes a year this way because time was uh, you know, not of the essence and uh, the desire was. So I would build in one year, the Thor, the Comet, uh, the Vulcan, I had uh, an ongoing project building summer, winter, there were always airplanes being built while they were being flown. So my knowledge moved fairly rapidly on this, on this type of construction and this type of airplane. And uh, I would have to say that uh, this is uh, about a three-year period to really understand the way these airplanes were built. There were no plans and uh, originally there was no help. So uh, I just w worked my way through it and uh, what I'm going to do is attempt uh, to show you the way I learned to do it with the, the drawing of the beams, the, the methods. I've had an awful lot of questions as classic has become popular now on uh, the way these airplanes were built and uh, I had assumed because of the kits and things that people pretty much understood the way they were built but I find a lot of the same questions coming from uh, different people. So what I'd like to do is uh, as we move along through this we're going to build a complete Aries wing and uh, try to answer any of the questions as well as showing uh, which we'll initially start with the way the uh, the way the wing is plotted and the way the airfoil is plotted and the way you come up with your beam sizes this whole thing while thought to be complex complex and appears to be complex uh, and made worse by the air Ambroid kit and things that were uh, you know had a lot of voodoo in them this uh, this will will should pan out uh, to be an, an easier project for most people than they would think. Most of you'll be building an I beam model for the very first time. Uh, you'll be working from these plans. All the work is done for you. All the plotting is, is done ahead of time. Uh, for those of you who wish to design an I-beam for yourself, to build, build your own design model, uh, there's a few guidelines that must be followed. And uh, we'll lay those out for you right now. To illustrate the layout procedure, let's start with a set of stock Aries plans. 
You might think that the tapers in the spar location of an I-beam wing would be determined by a top view plan form, but this is not the case. The term I-beam refers to the shape of the spar when viewed from the end. The center core of the spar is made from one quarter inch thick balsa. One sixteenth inch plywood doublers are added to the front and back of this core piece. One eighth inch thick top and bottom caps are added. And the finished shape is that of a capital I. Make a root template of the airfoil from plastic or aluminum. The surface of this template should be very smooth and accurate for the operations to follow. Draw the leading and trailing edge placement of the tip rib onto the center line of the drawing of the root rib. In the case of the Aries, the tip leading edge is one and five eighths inches behind the root leading edge position. Carefully position the rib template so it touches the top of the leading edge and trailing edge pieces. Trace around the rib template with a pencil to establish the upper tip rib profile. Measure down a quarter of an inch from the top of the tip rib profile and spar a location and make a mark. This mark indicates the top of the 1 8 inch top cap of the tip rib. Repeat the process to establish the bottom of the tip rib drawing. The distance between the two scribed lines is the depth of the I-beam spar at the tip rib position. Using the drawing you just made, develop tip rib jigs to support each end of the I-beam spar. The next step would be to laminate the fuselage sides. As you can see, we've done that right here. This is the balsa fuselage side. If you, I recommend this if you're going to use a heavier motor, uh, a newer Schnurley or a Tiger 46. This is balsa, doubler, carbon veil, balsa side. This is done with a liberal amount of epoxy. This is one of the few times that you would use this this amount of epoxy, but there's no integrity to the carbon veil if there's not enough epoxy. So use a slow cure epoxy, lay it out flat, preferably between two very flat surfaces, and clamp it overnight. If you're going to use a fox, something in, in the lightweight category, stay right with the 16th inch plywood doublers as per the plan. There's no need to go to this with a, with a light motor. The next thing we're going to do is square these body sides up. We'll do that by cutting the top of the fuselage sides perfectly parallel. I prefer to use a balsa stripper to trim the edges of the fuselage sides. This one is custom made by Les Nering but any of the ones available from a hobby shop will work fine. Lay a long metal straight edge over the side assembly and tape it down at both ends. Pressing down firmly on the straight edge, begin cutting the side with the stripper. Be sure to keep the blade tight against the straight edge. When you finish cutting the side, Sand the front edge square. Measuring from the plans, begin marking the outlines of the fuselage sides. Accuracy counts in this operation, so work slowly and carefully.
Be sure to use a small square when laying out the center section openings. Be especially careful when laying out the wing center line. With the doublers to the inside, place one of the sides over the other. Use a scrap balsa filler piece behind the doublers, then tape the sides together accurately. Using a scroll saw, cut out the fuselage openings in the external outline. Sand the edges and file the openings very carefully. There, we've completed our fuselage sides. Take a little time when you do these. Uh, there's really no, uh, you'll never have them too perfect, but you, they could certainly be, uh, be inaccurate. I've gone ahead and put exact center lines on everything, both sides. We're going to put this in a fuselage jig. We'll give you just a, a quick overview of that, uh, as that is built just like every other every other airplane. I've taken the liberty to make the uh, make the motor mounts. These start out as three eighths by half. They're then relieved an eighth of an inch which gives you room to move your tank further down. You can always shim back up. They're drilled. Then as you can see, we slot this just barely, very, very, very small grooves on the jigsaw just to give more gluing surface. This isn't absolutely necessary, but uh, it certainly can't hurt anything. Motor mount beam location is very important. Misaligned beams will stress the case when the engine is bolted to them, causing poor engine runs. So take some time here and get things straight. Recheck the fit of the beams before gluing. Use slow cure epoxy to attach the beams.
Place weights on or clamp the beam and let the epoxy cure thoroughly. Time to make a spar. As you can see, we've already moved forward in this area. This is a quarter inch balsa center joined diagonally. You can make that joint four, four and a half inches across. This is mahogany plywood on either side. The mahogany plywood uh, is somewhat lighter than the birch although the birch is acceptable. Uh, it's available at marine supply places and uh, if you look around it's, it's a, it seems to have come available again in the last four or five years. This is what I used on all my older airplanes and uh, the weight difference uh, makes it worth looking for. I'm going to go ahead right now and lay the spar out for you and do the drawing and then we'll go ahead and, and construct this spar. Start by taking the spar length dimensions from the plans. Note the two inch asymmetry that is built into the Aries. Measuring from the center of the spar, mark each end accordingly. Mark the position of the center line at the root. Lay a long and accurate metal straight edge on the spar. Line it up at the root mark and average or measure the center of the spar at the tip and carefully draw in the center line. Measure the depth of the spar without the caps from the plans and mark the spar. Follow the same procedure and mark the spar depth at the tips. Measure the width of the fuselage at the spar location and transfer these dimensions to the spar. Draw parallel lines on the spar where the fuselage will be positioned. Now using the straight edge, connect the ends of the parallel lines with the corresponding tip marks. This operation will require you to draw four accurate lines. Mark the inboard spar for the lead-out clearance slot. This slot should be no more than 3 32nd inch wide. Using a circle template, mark a half inch diameter semicircle at each end of what will become the bell crank clearance slot. Notice that the hole is laid out off-center and is longer than the Aries plans depict. 
The reason for this is that I intend to use a 4 inch belt crank in this model and it will require extra clearance. Whether a 3 or 4 inch belt crank is to be used, the center line of the belt crank is positioned to allow a straight 90 degree hookup to the flap horn. Cut the spar to length. Now very carefully, staying just outside of the line, saw the spar to shape. Using a 150 grit sandpaper block, carefully sand to the finished dimension. Next saw out the bell crank clearance slot. Sand the slot smooth. Now saw out the lead out slot in the inboard spot. Sand the slot smooth. On the forward face of the spar, relieve the inboard end of this slot to ensure front lead out clearance throughout its range of travel. Measure the depth of the spar triplers. These will fit between the bell crank clearance slot and the edge of the spar on both top and bottom. Lay them out on a sheet of 16th inch plywood and then saw them to size. Sand the edges smooth and then bevel the ends. Check the fit of the triplers on the spar and then install them using a slow cure epoxy. Wipe off any excess epoxy with a paper towel.